In 1979, the Fresno police scoured hundreds of square miles in their search for an abducted child. They failed to find her, and the desperate parents of eight-year-old Victoria de Santiago asked a psychic detective for help. On the psychic's instructions, the Fresno police were guided deep into the backwoods to a lonely chicken farm. At first, detectives Tim McFadden and Joel Popejoy were skeptical. I never dealt with a psychic before, and I thought I'd go up there and some lady in a gypsy garb with a flashing neon sign in her window said fortune teller would answer the door and would rattle a few bones and throw some incense and burn some stuff. And she wouldn't tell me a whole lot of anything, but the mother wanted to do it and uh, it seemed like we well, should go along with her. Well, when I got up there, I met Kay and uh, she was a very normal lady, just uh, typical. And within about 10 minutes of talking to her, I realized that this lady did know something about this case because she was telling me things that she shouldn't know. Kathleen Rea counts hundreds of police forces as satisfied customers. She told Sergeant McFadden that the girl was dead. She had seen the tragedy enacted in a vision. Now, the first thing I saw was her being taken into a car with her little sister and the dog by two men at the time. I feel one man left before it was all over. And then I started seeing the direction. I wanted to look to see where did they drive her. And I felt they took her on a highway that was going north. And then I felt that uh, then they went off of that highway onto what I felt was more of a country road. And I could uh, see the uh, chicken farm because I kept seeing feathers. I kept saying it's like lots of feathers, like there's a chicken ranch, a poultry ranch. She told me that the body was out east of town, that um, I should look for a, a road in the country, that I should look for something to do with chickens or feathers that there was a windmill nearby, that the body was laying parallel to the road near a plowed field, that there was a, it was laying near the base of a tall tree. Victoria had been with her dog. Kathleen Rea was certain it was still alive. She said the dog would lead the police to the child's body. The dog was still missing. And as I left the house, you know, after a couple hours of interviewing her, she stopped me, and I'll never forget this, she said, Tim, you find the dog, and you'll find the girl's body, because I knew the dog was near it. They didn't drop the dog off somewhere else. I received a radio call that there had been a dog found that resembled the victim's dog. I, at that point, responded to this address. I uh, made contact with the owner of the property and called the dog by name once entering the residence. The dog came to me. At that point, uh, I felt that this possibly could be the victim's dog. So when I arrived here and I called Detective McFadden, I asked him, what else do you have in order to isolate this area? Now, the time that I arrived here, it was dark. Really no visual at all other than finding the address and gaining entry. And I asked, Detective McFadden, what else was there? And he said, a windmill. And I thought, well, I've got you now. There's no windmill. I couldn't see any windmill when I pulled up. And I asked the gentleman, and he said, yes, there's one in the front of the house. You'd have seen it if it wasn't dark. So I told the people there, you know, we need to go out there. We, we, need, we all need to go out there and look. And we brought about 10 or 15 detectives out here and started walking. And with a matter of 10 minutes, a parab had found the body of Victoria de Santiago right down the road here, probably a half a mile from where we're standing, at the base of a big tree. And the things that she had told me about the body were all there too. She said there'd be a windmill. It was outside where Detective Popejoy was. She told me, find the dog and you'd find Victoria. Detective Popejoy had found the dog. She said there would be a freshly plowed field. She said there'd be an orchard. All these things were here. Sadly, this tragic case has never been solved. Psychics often volunteer to help the police, from Jack the Ripper in Victorian England to the serial killers of the late 20th century. Countless people claiming paranormal powers have offered to crack unsolved murders or missing person cases that have hit the headlines. Sometimes the psychics can do better than ordinary investigators. For example, when the famous crime novelist, Agatha Christie, disappeared in 1926, everyone thought she was dead. Then, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, 
called in a psychic, who announced that Miss Christie was alive and would turn up soon, which she duly did. Each psychic crime buster has a different technique. In a recent case, one used an object to focus on. When five-year-old Tommy Kennedy went missing, his favorite sneakers were the key to his rescue. Teams of searchers combed the forests around Empire Lake all day. By nightfall, they feared the worst. Nice to have you with us. How are you doing? Good. Good to have you back. You enjoying your summer? Yes, pretty good. good. Then a local priest made an extraordinary offer to help the searchers. He asked for something of Tommy's. They gave him a sneaker. I find that when I, when I work, especially with missing persons cases, that if I have an article that has been in their possession, for some reason I can tune in uh, more positively to them. Well, after I had the sneaker in my possession, was able to tune in even more, I really felt that I had to uh, sort of project ahead and know what was what was going to be the path that I would have to take. Well, I think there were a lot of skeptics. Uh, there were some people that uh, were sure that he was a witch or a demon from hell, but there were also uh, others of us that uh, knew Phil and uh, knew what he could do and uh, certainly had some faith in him. From the picture he saw in his mind's eye, Phil Jordan drew a map. He's kept it to this day. And I, I said there will be three overturned boats. And directly across from those boats, there would be a building. And we would have to go into a thicket and a wooded area behind that building and continue on up until we found a clearing that had a pile of rocks. There would be a brook or a stream. And a little ways past that, we would find um, Tommy Kennedy asleep under a tree. So we got here and, uh, of course, Phil had the map. And as we uh, approached the area, it was just like it was a uh, Kodak photo. Uh, and we set off in the direction that Phil had indicated uh, with full confidence. When I went into the woods, I would hold the sneaker and, and it seemed as though each time I would touch it, it would uh, tell me what direction to go, so to speak. The vibrations would draw me to the right, to the left, go forward, um, continue on. And so um, I think it just acted as a, an instrument to help tune me into his location. 17 hours of searching had failed to locate Tommy. Phil found him alive and well in minutes. When, when we did find Tommy, uh, it was an extremely emotional uh, time for me. It was. It was very draining to work psychically that long, and, and I was fatigued mentally, but I think the, the spiritual experience of the whole thing, of being able to uh, save a little boy's life, and knowing that he was okay, I just knelt and wept. Very often, however, psychic detectives provide completely misleading information. When an American general was kidnapped in Italy in the 1980s, the Pentagon was deluged with offers of paranormal assistance. But they stopped listening after 500 policemen raided a house described by one psychic and found an innocent and very surprised family having breakfast. Ironically, psychics who provide too accurate information can get into trouble. A compelling vision drove Etta Louise Smith to a remote canyon high in the hills above Los Angeles. She'd heard on the news that police were searching for a missing nurse. Detectives were carrying out house-to-house -house inquiries, but Etta Louise says she knew exactly where 18-year-old Melanie Uribe was. It was as if I heard a voice or someone tell me, she's not in the house. And as soon as I, I registered that thought, she's not in a house, it was like I saw a picture. It was as clear as a photograph in front of me. I could see where she was. The picture was of a curvy road in the canyon, a curve on the right, dirt path going out to something white and a hill behind, and a lot of shrubbery, a lot of bush. And I knew. I went into the police station. I met a gentleman, a detective, uh, Mr. Lee Ryan. He was genuinely interested. 
And uh, I said, I know it's strange, but I can't explain this. So he asked me if I knew the name of the street, and I said, no, I don't. Uh, I, I know how to get there. I know where it is. I don't know the name. Well, I went home. We all get in the van. We drove through this canyon and got all the way to the top, and we had not spotted anything white and shrubbery. And all of a sudden, my daughter says, Mama, Mama, stop, stop. I said, what is it, honey? She said, Mama, stop, I saw something. And I stopped. And I said, look, honey, what do you think you saw? She says, Ma, I see something white out there. She said, Ma, it's a body. And I'm going, oh, no, no. I said, Tina. She said, Ma, it's a body. This person had on no clothing, and that's another thing that made it very difficult to see and understand what I was looking at. But the only thing this person or this object had was white nurse's shoes. Etta Smith told the police of her gruesome discovery. Amazed by her story, they promptly arrested her. Etta was charged with murder and jailed for five days. She was only freed when three youths were overheard discussing the crime and arrested. Determined to clear her name, Etta Smith hired lawyer James Blatt. I can't make a, a judgment call on all the other psychic uh, phenomena that occur. All I can say is the one that I experienced here appeared to be valid. She found the body. There's been no evidence whatsoever that she knew anyone connected to the crime. And she acted as a responsible, concerned citizen. Uh, based upon that, she was subsequently arrested for the murder. Uh, she spent five days in a jail cell and I indicated to the jury that I felt that that type, that the arrest was unlawful, that she should be remunerated for that arrest, and that having a vision and acting upon that vision is not a crime. The judge ruled in our favor, and then the jury ruled in our favor. Thanks to James Blatt, Etta Smith was awarded $24,000 for wrongful arrest. It took me six years to clear my name. Um, I'm glad I did it. I, I felt that it could be done, but if it had taken 20, I think I would still be fighting. I, I wouldn't have quit until I cleared my name. In the old gold rush town of Jackson, the police are polishing new skills. Sheriff Ken Blakes called in Judy Bell to lecture his men on psychometry. going to do is you're going to come over, you're going to pick up an object, take it back to your table, do psychometry on it, write about it. <laughs> Psychometrists believe that objects pick up vibrations, especially when crimes involved. Judy says detectives can learn to tune in to vital clues embedded in the evidence. If you took a room full of people and took them out and taught them how to play basketball, some of them would be really good and some of them wouldn't. You take a group of people, whether they're police officers or not, and you start teaching them psychic things, some of them are going to be good, some of them aren't. Some of them are going to be good in one area, some are going to be good in another. Everybody's going to be able to do it, but whether or not they can do it well depends upon how much natural ability they've got to start with. It's interesting, I get a, a feeling of very softness about it. It's not, a, it's not a violent, even though it's a gun, I don't feel um, any harshness out of it. It's a real soft feeling, almost a feminine feeling. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, I'm getting some type of feeling and, and that uh, I'm learning from this. The first weapon I picked up was this one, and uh, it just, I got shakes, and I'd have sworn when I pick it up that, uh, that it had killed somebody. I'm not saying that uh, we will be able to uh, solve every crime because we have now gone through Judy Bell's course. But I think that the, some of the techniques that we've learned will allow them to be better investigators, to be better interviewers, and, uh, and, and I think that we'll be better police officers in the long run. At the University of Hertfordshire, British researchers are mounting an experiment to put extrasensory detection to the test. They've gathered grisly relics from a police black museum and have invited psychics to describe the crimes in which they were used. 
Two observers have been called in to help psychologist Dr. Richard Wiseman assess the results. They're Donald West, retired professor of criminology at Cambridge University, and journalist Roy Stemmen of Psychic News. They'll watch from behind a two-way mirror. The test today is uh, looking at people who claim to be psychic. They claim to be able to handle objects that are connected with a crime and tell us psychically about that crime. And today what we're doing is comparing how well they do on the test versus a group of people that don't claim that ability. And today, that's the students. Exhibit A is a shoe worn by a woman murdered in 1899. Her body lay in a secret grave for four years. Her killer was in the army and was hanged in 1901. Exhibit B is a bullet which killed a policeman in the 1920s. It was one of three fired into his head by two attackers. They too were hanged. A 70-year-old woman wore Exhibit C. The scarf was used to strangle her during a burglary. The killer was a milkman. First on are the psychics. Chris Robinson's technique is to dream about the objects in advance. The dreams that I had to do with item A were to do with a woman, to do with a woman who was murdered, and I had an area around Tottenham Court Road in London. Um, I thought she had been shot. I was expecting to see a gun. Going to the object um, B, Very strange because when I've been thinking about um, tuning into the objects um, with the item B, I felt a brick wall. I felt something there which was undisclosed, or something that's been not revealed. Um, all I got was a brick wall. Whether this is for not me to see or whether it is something still uh, undisclosed, but uh, something there that has not been unrevealed and I've just heard a loud bang. Yeah, a feeling of helplessness and abuse and extreme rage. So I feel very much like a person that had that sort of object actually sort of uh, suffered a very violent death, <clears throat> something to do with the sort of neck sort of area. But it was this sort of feeling, if you like, then of helplessness and blind panic, rage, anger, fear, then it's the turn of the students. A robbery of some sort. Seems worn from earth, probably been left for quite a time in undergrowth or something in some sort of forest area. I think this is going to be worn by an old woman. Who's no doubt dead. So we can't I'm expecting the magazine. <laughs> is it a bullet? Um, after the oral test, the written paper. In detailed questionnaires, psychics and students must now match the facts of each crime to the objects. Okay. So we've got uh, a, which is uh, the shoe there. There's the 18 statements, and all we want to do is just read them and tick the six that you think go with. The scarf, we, we all three of us had a, a sense of suffocation or being tied up, uh, there was death there. Um, the second one, I felt we all had difficulties with that. The last thing I heard was the bang. I just couldn't really link with the, the bullet. Um, the first one was being underground. I don't think I did very well. I didn't have much time to think about it and I felt a bit under pressure and just said the first thing that came to my head. In terms of success, I did think that the shoe and the scarf did belong to a woman and an elderly woman at that, um, but in terms of the t overall success, I wouldn't say I did very well. Um, I don't think I was very successful at all, besides the things, it's physical attributes, I mean, that's obviously a, an old slug bullet or whatever. I mean, uh, a woman's going to be wearing that shoe and perhaps that sort of scarf. I mean, that's just something physically ob obvious, but uh, I can't really look into it and say, well, you know, that's an incident surrounding that. It's just... As it turned out, the students did better than they thought. Well, both the psychics and the students could have scored a maximum of 54. In fact, the psychics scored 19 and the students scored 22. 
These cases are impressive, but far from typical. The police will tell you that not only do the psychics' failures far outnumber their successes, but they often hamper detection. Yet, here's one case which impresses even this hardened skeptic. In Watsika, Illinois, Vic Carho has never forgotten Greta Alexander. When 11-year-old Larry Dean Cotter was washed away in the icy Iroquois River in 1980, Greta led Carho to his body by long-distance phone. The minute he said to me, I have a missing child, 11-year-old, that we think is drowned, immediately you become that person. You rise to the occasion. And uh, so from that moment on, I was with Larry Dean. You feel what he felt. You feel like you're having such a good time and laughing. And the next thing you know, you step back and you're going under the water. And the next thing you know is you're turning and rolling and turning and rolling. And the current is so strong and you can't get out because it's like the roof over your head and you can't get out, you can't get out, which was the ice. Credit was about 130 miles from where we were at at the Namatsika. And so uh, she, she began to describe the landscape and things that was up there. And I said, well, now wait just a minute. I need to get on the scene so I can pass this message on and we'll figure out some way to communicate with you when I get there. They had a mobile phone and they were at the scene of where he had gone under the water. I then described to them the muddy bank and the fact that there was a, like a rail tie, and the area which they were in, and they saw everything as they were at the phone. So I knew then that I was right, and once I get that feeling I'm right, then I can really go with it. And then uh, you, you hear, and you hear the boats and the motors, and you hear them cutting the ice, and you hear those things just as Larry Dean would have heard. And so you see pictures, and it's like watching television. And you, you hear it just as though you were hearing it in your mind's eye. Soon after I had established communication with her, she told me to face the water. And so I did face the water. Now she said, turn to your right. And I turned to my right. She says, now walk straight ahead. Well, I said, I can't walk. I've not got a long strength. She'd have someone walk for you. So I got this fire chief from Decatur, and he was walking straight ahead. And she told me when he steps across or falls over a little pile of brush, stop him and have him face the water. And so uh, when he stepped over, and sure enough, he came to this thing, he stepped over, and I hollered, stop, and I'll face the water. And she said, you're looking right at me. See my hand and they actually saw the boy's hand, and they saw shadows, and this is how we, we located them, and they called us to, to get the boy's body. After they found Larry Dean, uh, I felt a peace. I felt um, that a job was well done, and that the relief of the parents of having their son being able to be brought home, the not knowing, the, the, the horrendous, pain that they were going through. Not that they wouldn't suffer again from the loss, but that it had been completed. Mm -hmm.